the crazy thing is, the first time I saw Jack was he, when he was playing for Luton against the Arlene team over at a local wow. legacy center in Potter's Bar. And um, Sean saw him that day. Sean had already got the role at Arsenal was moving. And that's how that move with Jack perhaps actually happened. And that's the first time we actually we saw him. And I think, you know, that under tennis group that he went into a plethora of really talented players. Do you know what I mean? You know, at that time, the best academy in the country, you know, that the recruitment team we had and the players they were able to attract to that football club was incredible. And yes, Jack had something special, but a lot of the players in that group had something special. But, you know, what Jack had, he took that on, obviously, to, to his playing career, was the way he could just receive the ball, move the ball, you know, get it the other side. And people, he was just such a hard player to mark, yet such desire. You know, he was just a wonderful player to watch, you know, grow up and then see him in the first team and, and do so well. It's just such a shame with injuries. Hello, Balogun, a cheeky back heel. With ease, Miguel Aziz, his first goal for Portsmouth. Into the path of Smith Rowe, into the box. Smith Rowe scores! A really deserved first goal in Huddersfield Town Colours. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Away From Hail End, and we have a very, very special guest here, Dan Buck, who's been with and around the club for much longer than I personally have, and that's for sure. Actually very involved in the Hail End setup. Dan, tell us about yourself, what you do with Hail End, and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Will. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for making me feel as old as I feel as well, Will. It's been a, <laughs> a long time, so I've been involved in the county football for 27 seasons. Uh, so a long, long time. Not all at Arsenal. This is my 16th season at, at Arsenal. Um, and um, basically, I started at Barnet, which is a, a smaller club, obviously in the, in the lower leagues in uh, in England. Um, moved to Arsenal in the early 2000s, where I spent a good bit of time. Then went to Tottenham, which will obviously be a, a really popular choice by the, uh, the Arsenal fans. <laughs> and then uh, a number of us have worked at... Um, uh, Tottenham and Arsenal together. We went to Brentford for six seasons as they came off the lead line up to up to the Premiership. And then since 2014, we've back at back at Arsenal and um, doing various age groups, all the way from sevens, eights, four teams, and more recently with 15, 16 over the last four years. And is this always what you wanted to do? Be involved in youth football setups and and be involved with big clubs? I know, obviously. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about what your you call your full time job is as well. Um, and is it just always been a passion of yours, or, or you know, tell me about what what the path was to that? Why did you choose this career? Yeah, it's it's always been part time for me. So I do have I always call it a proper job because it always <laughs> feels like football is a, a more enjoyable element of what I do in my in my weekly routine. So um, my full time job I'm a I'm a, I'm a corporate director at uh, Big Leisure. Um, company here in um, North London, last May 6th, we own half of the little bit part. So, seven years of my life was a big spoon in London 2012, and the legacy does that they come from that. So, that's why I do it in my day job. Um, and I coached Cover, Skills Academy, stuff like that when I was 16, just to get a bit of extra money in. I've always been interested in playing football. I was never the best in the world. I think it's the best way to I was never going to be a car or anything like that. And then I had a bad leg, bad leg break at uh, 18. Um, I was in class for eight months. So I spent the majority at, because that was back in the day, there was no Netflix. My family yes. weren't rich enough to have Sky. So, you know, there was no internet apart from a bit of dial up and everything like that. So I spent that entire eight months researching, coaching really as much as I could. My mom used to dropping over, you know, Things like DVDs like Mexico 86, Old Hero um, DVD, which was amazing. Um, and just looking at players and how to develop players and just looked at coaching style of things a little bit more and kind of made a decision that the same I wanted to have a go at when I, when I got back on, on two feet. Worked to a lot of clubs and finally it was one that came back the most positive. Um, and then as soon as I was out of class, I went in there and Gary Carlson who was the uh, academy director at the time, got us involved in that and the football community side of things. And it kind of, it kind of went from there, really, to be honest with you. And I had three really good years, kind of starting to learn my trade at, at, at Barnet there. And then 
Arsenal came calling or what was what was the move there to to be able to move from Barnet to, you know, at the time, which was the biggest club or second biggest club in the UK? So um, one of the scouts that's still at Arsenal now, a guy from Sean O'Connor, who's the best recruitment guy I've ever worked with, he was with us at, at Arnett. He got offered a role at Arsenal and uh, he stuck his neck out and got me he got me over there. You know, Roy Massey, who was the academy director at the time, um, got us involved, mainly with the pre-academy start, the sevens and eights. But I was doing quite a lot of help in the academy support with some of the other coaches. So... And I worked a lot with Jack Wilshire when he came in first as an under 10 at that time, which is mad now. And he's obviously our new teammate. Yeah. Um, Incredible. Working with the likes of Harry Kane as another nine, and Ikafobi and Chuck Samiki and stuff like that. So I was more of a support coach, really, at that time. And then the guy that was taking the um, under 10s at Arsenal last season, at the end of it, left. And Roy, you know, he didn't have to, you know, give a 21 year old coach which at that time there was no 21 year old coaches so right. you know he saw must have seen the same thing me and you know gave me the opportunity to coach in the academy so i then started doing the nine season after um like it's still with seven space in the front of the center as you know i was 21 what else are you going to do apart from coach every night and go to work i was lucky my job was uh it was a lifeguard at that time so i was working shift work so it meant if i was working in the day i could come in the night and if i was working at night i could come in the day so i worked a lot with it with like the six teams, I was able to go to to Cody. It was the first year we moved there, and we also like just watch the lights had gone how and the old Banfield work and everything like that. So it was, yeah, it was a very very fortunate time to go in there, really. And something else going, I got the opportunity, and it was an opportunity that I tried to take as much as I could, which, given my circumstances at that time, I was able to do. Well, you mentioned two very polarizing names there, obviously, and amongst many other amazing names you just mentioned, Jack Wilshire and, of course, Harry Kane. Jack Wilshire, was it just obvious immediately upon the first time you worked with him, like what a talent that Arsenal had on their hands? Obviously, Roy knows it didn't always work out with injuries and whatnot, but by 16, he was playing the Champions League for Arsenal. Was it clear when you were working with him as an under 10 that this is a special player? The crazy thing is, the first time I saw Jack was he, when he was playing for Luton against our army team over at a local wow. in Potter's Bar. And um, Sean saw him that day. Sean had already got the role at Arsenal, was moving. And that's how that move with Jack perhaps, uh, actually happened. And that's the first time we actually we saw him. And I think, you know, that under tennis group that he went into, a uh, clever of really talented players. Do you know what I mean? And Arsenal at that time, the best academy in the country, you know, that the recruitment team we had and the players they were able to attract to that football club was incredible. And yes, Jack had something special, but a lot of the players in that group had something special. But, you know, what Jack had, and he took that on, obviously, to, to his playing career, is the way that he could just receive the ball, move the ball, you know, get it the other side. And people, he was just such a hard player to mark, yet such desire, you know, he was just a wonderful player to watch, you know, grow up and then see him in the first team and, and do so well. It's just such a shame with injuries, but it just shows any young player that you can have all the potential and ability in the world and sometimes circumstances just go against you, but it's true. But, you know, it, I'm so fortunate that I was able to work with players like that who just took me so much to see what the level was because where you're coming from, oh, and it was the boys were good. You know, they did what they could, but then we walk in there and see that level and not to one player, eight players in the group, or nine players in the group, you know. I always say, my first day at Arsenal, I remember watching the under-11s, which was Heavy Lansby, Sanchez, what's that magnificent group? Well, yeah, for you've got with obviously Jack in there as well. And within about five minutes, Sanchez got a cross in and Henry headed the ball like Alan Shearer. As an I've never seen it's nothing like it. And I said to the time that Charlie was taking the group, I was like, that is unbelievable. You know, it just, the, the devil just grabbed you within five minutes of being through the door. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, he, he, he was a special player without a shadow of a doubt and a really good lad to coach, you know, he really did push you as a coach and, you know, for thing, for players to be able to help your career and your journey doing those things is, is, is something I'm really appreciative of, actually. Definitely. And you mentioned with Jack, obviously, his ability to scan and, and read the pitch and receive the ball on the half turn. And some of those things that, to me, as someone who's not ever been involved in, in youth coaching, feel a little bit more innate than necessarily a talent that you can work on. Is that how it is? Like, does he just have a brain that's a little bit different than everybody else's? Is that why 
he had such an ability to scan and kind of know where everyone was on the pitch to be able to receive the ball with the player on your back and, and take a touch away or, or let the ball run. Does that come more naturally to some players than other, or is that just something that he worked on harder than anybody else? Yeah, I, I think it was the same for me in his DNA as a, as, as a player. You know, there are things that us as coaches can, can work on and make bets up, but ultimately some players come with that X factor that's something special. They don't always end up becoming the top player. Because you know you're talking about nine and ten year old lads, but uh, yeah, he he definitely has something different. You don't see that regularly. You know, you don't have many Jack Walshers coming through and stuff like that. You know, at the end of the day, some of the players might end up getting to a, a level like he did eventually in the first team. But it's it's rare to see that type of player in, in the 27 years I've worked in in the game. You know, you don't see many of them that just stand out so much. You know, he was more. He turned a lot more as a winger at that side as well. He was a little bit younger. Um, I did have players on as well. He was great one v one, and you know, just had that it not like, X factor really. As I say, there was a few in that group that were very similar. Connor Henderson, who's with us now as a as a coach, who was in that group, you know, certainly had that as a midfield player as well. Where people like John Joe Shelby at that time was in that group, and you know, he he was a really good football player. He wasn't quite as dynamic as what Jack was, but. Do you know what I mean? There was a lot of them there, and they all fed off each other and just pushed each other to iron high levels. You mentioned Harry Kane. I just did you were you there when he was he was at Hill End? Then you when he left, were you then also with him when you were at Tottenham, or that didn't line up as well? No, I was. I've never been Harry's head coach, um, but I've kind of been in and around and coached him. I coached him more when he was at Arsenal originally. So does he have quite a lot of players at nine? Well, one yeah. of the things that Massey was brilliant at, a number of things that Massey was brilliant <laughs> at, was the games program that he put on for the players. Was it, no, it was relentless. We were the Sony games every <laughs> week. We played local teams and, you know, and it's one of the ways that we recruited back in the day as well. Get okay, local teams in, seeing the players and everything like that. It was just, just gave more great. opportunity, basically, right? Exactly right. And the Saturday players, but the, the players that might not be in the squad on a Sunday, and obviously the Sun, they would say, will always have his top players with Benitez in their store and play goals every week and stuff like that. And Harry found himself in that Saturday group a little bit more often with me for that. And you would <laughs> never, you know, if someone had said, Harry will have, you know, you know Benitez had a good career, but if you, them two at the last station say, Harry will have a better career than any people would have thought you were mad. Um, and then obviously they looked at different things. We documented they even looked at becoming a goalkeeper, like the keepers for a period of time. And then what I think really helped is he went back into brass roots for a period of time. And when I moved over to Tottenham, he had just been signed. And that was a very, very difficult. Tottenham were in a really difficult place. When Joel McDermott, who's now head of the FA, um, went in there and Chris Ramsey, the place was in disarray. You know, it was in a room that state. And those guys did an unbelievable job of Richard Allen and heading up the recruitment to push things on. He came in as one of the early players. Um, and didn't set the world like he did okay, he played every week because the team were in a, in a situation. And I think it was around, once he get under 16, he just seems to, he, he grew, he was quite a small, kind of big kid, but he always had yeah. been And everyone's also, seen that picture of him at the Invincibles parade. He's kind of a smaller, old, chubber. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I was there that day, it was madness because we were playing games at Hydra that day. And um, yeah, he just started to find his feet. And Chris Ramsey and Tim Sherwood and Alex Inglethorpe, all them three guys, including John McDermott, deserve a lot of credit. They kept him in the system. They worked with him. When really believing, you know, particularly people like Chris Ramsey really saw sank in him that maybe others did. And I think the shows that the experience that he's got and having those experienced characters around, you know, just gave him that confidence, gave him that opportunity. And... Even when he came into Spurs as first team, you know, people weren't sure about him. He's just grown and grown. But the last thing you always say about Harry, and he's taught me more about youth development than any other player I've had. You've got a lad out there who couldn't have struggled anymore at under nine and under 10 to become where he is now, setting all sorts of records over in the Bundesliga. It just shows you that determination. He's always a good technique, really coachable. It just shows you about not making decisions too early when someone's got say. Also, some players can end up being like a hype to younger Ryan just because of their physical domination or whatever it might be. And he just shows that when you see something in a player, particularly as an experienced coach, and a player, every stick you get from them, they develop more, they show more, you've got to keep believing in them, really. And 
it's just incredible. His journey is a very, very unique journey that so many players would have given up, full and out laugh with the game, you know, not been able to push on. So the, the credit that lad deserves is incredible, really. For sure. And I think it speaks volumes to, I think a lot of fans get upset when a player ends up leaving the academy and then four years later, they're killing it somewhere else. Like, I think we saw that, we've seen that with Arsenal with Serge Gnabry, we've seen it with Daniel Malin. Players who were good in the academy, they had moments, but maybe... The timing just wasn't always right or whatever it might be. They developed later. And I think people think it's very easy to just tell at a certain age, oh, this player is great and the others aren't. And as you're saying, you know, for Harry Kane, he was being tried out as a goalkeeper when he was 10 years old. And and here he is being, you know, as much as many Arsenal fans pains to say, the, probably the best striker in the world it has been for almost a decade. So my question to you is you mentioned grassroots football and how he went to that. Roel Walters, another one who actually did the opposite, left Tottenham's academy took a couple of years away from like big academies. I think he played some grassroots football as well and now has seen, you know, a lot of success at Hale End. Do you suggest that as a path for young footballers who are maybe struggling and trying to figure out what the future is, maybe take a little bit of the pressure off themselves of a big academy and, and, and find their ability to their love for the game again? I think it's different for everyone, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's cliche to say that everyone has a different <laughs> journey. And, you know, Ruel, I was in the 16th when Ruel came into us. And again, you know, you can't wish for a for a for a young player that's more coachable and wanting to learn and really wanting to push himself. I think it helped because he had done a lot of work with Saul Hurst, who's an individual coach, and I do a lot of the technical work with the players at that age and really bought into it and really pushed himself and really developed. And you know that physical side of it is something that's come more and more as he's got a, a little bit older. Um, you know, Chris Meglin, who's at Bournemouth centre half, he's a good example yeah. of that as well. He got released from Chelsea. At trials everywhere. When he came into us at Brentford, I was at the end of the under 15 season. He had um, been playing men's football. Um, he had been rejected by his beloved QPR. And he was really, I think this was the last chance to learn. And we took a gamble on him because he had something our other defenders didn't have. And he knew his mobility wasn't the greatest, but we would work with it. And, you know, he's coming on, he's having a great career, Wales International, everything like that. So that non league uh, men's football really helped him out. So I think for another person, it might not work. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it really is. Academy football is a huge pressure cooker for the players and for parents, particularly now with social media and everything like that. As you're saying, it only takes like the under 16s or the youth teams to lose and Twitter saying this, that, and the other, and players score six, and then they think he's going to be in the first team next week and, and everything like that. The pressure on the players and the, and the parents is, is, is a mess nowadays. And sometimes, it helps being taken out of the melee and being safe different. You know, Harry coming out of Arsenal might have saved his career and having a pause and going into to Tottenham in a difficult point where he played every week and everything like that. So it, it, it really, it, you can never ever tell, you know, what's going to work for a player. You know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't work out. You know, youth development is not linear in that regard. And that bit between 16 and St. Swingsy, where you're looking to get in first in. Anything can happen in that time. You know, <laughs> voice change. There's a lot that goes on in their lives. Um, opportunities, because it depends on where the first team are. You know, of our first team now are a little bit more like what they were in the early 2000. Again, our first team now, you've got to be right up there now. When the Kelp first come in, that wasn't necessarily the case. So, you know, it's, it all depends where the club is in that given moment, where you are, where you're fit, and where there's opportunities for you, and how you develop in that time. You know, and that's where things like the loans come in. So, or you look at someone like Rick Norton Cuffey, who's, you know, been on loan last couple of years, really blossoming as a player and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a, it can be a really crazy time that, so you just never know what's going to happen. 100%. Bring you back a little bit to the beginning of the conversation, not to age you, but you said you've been in youth coaching for 27 years. Can you just talk about some of the biggest changes you've seen across, not just Arsenal, but in youth football, both scouting and training. Obviously, sports science has taken such a major step, but I'm sure coaching and other things have also changed quite a bit during that time period. Are there a couple of things that really stand out to you from when you first started this profession to, to where we are now? I think probably the biggest thing is about people. It's like, that's just as far as many people from now, um, which is obviously a big thing because it plays a lot more care, attention, you know, for school staff and everything like that. I'd say, our, you know, our club was always... When you looked at recruitment, we were always here at going. We was everywhere. You could go anywhere, any football match, local football match, not find a nasty scout. 
Do you know what I mean? We weren't just opening that work. And that network was obviously promoting it especially now as, you know, as, as time moves on and the players get older. But when we look at the kind of, I used to do it all myself. You know, I might have one support coach at times or whatever, but now there's three of us. Do you know what I mean? For every single right. way for it, which is incredible for <laughs> the class to in that amount of resources into, you know, really developing the players. Not every class doing that. And I think, you know, that's one of the things why Howland is different. This place is different. That's why we produce so many good players because, you know, we see the benefit in not just getting the best players, which is the most important bit at the beginning, but really developing those players within the academy. I think you look at the physio size, you've got nutritionists, you've got psychologists now, you know, the strength and conditioning guys, we've got travel, people that organize all the travel, like right. catering staff, you know, it's, it's a really big complex operation. The support network there for players and the parents is, is amazing. Like a player care team, you know, really making sure that, you know, whatever's going on in the player's life, whether that's at the academy or all life, are supported in a certain, in a certain way. And just the whole medical and you know, strength and conditioning side of things. So, you know, scientific and so meticulous now, you know, it's just another level. And I think lastly is analysis. Obviously when I started, there was no videos. You know, right. like the opera of a cat, but you know, Sam's just was his cat was always recording every single game and stuff like that. A little so, camcorder. <laughs> but you know, now, you know, the stats would get yeah, particularly the older age groups. We got all the stats, you know, complete passes, you know, duels, where crosses are you know, it's like we had no we had twenty crosses and scored one goal. I can get that clip and see, you know, where the centre forwards were, what the movement was like, why didn't you score, was it crossing the right area? You know, it's the right. tools we have now to improve the players is improving. Now, all the big plus have got that. So the key is how we use that in a way that other clubs aren't using it to benefit right. our players more than the other clubs. You know, some people use it for using its sake, and it's about how we can make it really meaningful. And, you know, some players really embrace it and are quite geeky around that kind of side of things. Others aren't. You know, kids don't watch as much football now as they used to. You know, it's kind of like, on the way, isn't it? Everyone likes snippets, not looking right. at long The fact that we have time. it all now makes it almost less important to watch to some people. Like before, if you were able to watch something, it was like, oh, I got this is must see. Now you can see everything, so people don't watch anything. No, I mean, exactly right. But it's just how, you know, the culture of, you know, what young boys were like that in the early 2000s, what they like now, it's just a different world, it's a different culture. We have to, as a as a club, adapt to that and make sure that we're creating the best environment for them to carry on developing, which, you know, I think we're doing a really good job of. So, yeah, it's just the whole professional side of it. You know, I was lucky coming into Arsenal, we were already ahead of the game and, you know, more professional than, than most people are honest with them, anyone we ever saw, really. You know, our whole nuts and how we did things and everything like that were always very different to everyone else you saw. Um, and I think you still see that now. You know, the recent, when I was in Sunderland, we were under 15s. Won the international Premier League tournament just the way things gone by. And you see our players at cleaning tables and putting in chairs and all dressed the same and all walking together. You know, you didn't see that from the upper class that were sharing our hotel. And I think that just shows kind of the unique culture that we have at this club. And, you know, whether the players are good enough for Arsenal's thirsty or whether they can't speak pros or whether they have to do something else, and they just get taught in a different way and become, you know, really, really good people. I think that's what, you know, the Academy wants to achieve. And first of all, congratulations, I was going to say, on the under-15 international tournament win last week. That's amazing. Um, is there anything you want to touch on from that? Obviously, there's not a lot of coverage of that for, for good reason, but anything that people should know about tournaments like that, like that for the under-15s and the younger age groups, I think it is a good thing probably that people can't access watching all this as, as it puts too much pressure on kids at such a young age. Um, but are there any things that you think fans would love to know that, that can be shared about, you know, an event like that? Well, first of all, Josh Smith is the head of coach, the under 15s. So he deserves a, you know, the largest slice of the, uh, the credit, but that definitely, group, and you wouldn't play the team took up there. Even he goes back to Joe Sutton, that's not a car anymore, who was ahead of the pre-academy at that time. And the scouts have got the nucleus of that team have been with us since under seven, under eight, and they've grown through in the recruitment team and done a really good job of adding. And the coaches, they've had all the way through, have done well at developing the players and we go. So, you know, those kind of successes, you should never look at, you know, a result as a success because we had a penalty that was a bit dubious, maybe in one of the games. <laughs> you know, that don't go your way. Who knows what can happen? But 
You know, sure. I think, you know, what Chelsea's done well is use his experienced coaches this year to help develop the players. It was really good to see that our style was different to everyone else's. Even, you know, it was Sunderland. The wind chill was about minus two. The, the rain was building down. The wind was howling. And to be able to play the kind of football that the players did, we couldn't consistently do it all the way through. We were stronger and stronger as the tournament went on. It was different to everyone else. And, you know, we in Sporting Lisbon, particularly in the second vein, the manner in which we passed the ball, moved, runs, the individual 1v1s that we were able to be successful with was real credit to kind of the coaching program that's put together. Um, so I think the pleasing thing is, even if the boys haven't got over the line, say you lose a penalty shootout against Villa in the final, I think, you know, Red Player is small, looks great. Um, and there could have been a couple of other contest- contenders for that. Um, but I think really the, the style and manner in which we approached it, I think was really the pleasing thing and just seeing that DNA, that Arsenal DNA, which is important because under pressure, it's very hard to play in that type of way. You know, it's quite easy to revert to type and maybe hit it a bit longer. Um, the boys have still got a journey to do with that, but you know, really, really pleased that the progress has been shown. But as I say, you should never ever look at winning a trophy or winning a tournament as, oh, wow, they all go first team now because it just doesn't work like that. You know, you get your bit of luck as you go through. You know, other teams got knocked out that you expect to go through and sometimes it's your week and it's as simple as that. But no, the, the boys should be really proud of themselves. And as I say, Josh should be really proud of the great work he's done and what Don's the same as the, uh, as the face lead. So all good. Great. And can you talk a little bit, you mentioned the Arsenal DNA and the way that Arsenal played differently than all the other clubs at the tournament. I think we all have an idea of what that is as fans and, and watching it over all these years. But can you just speak a little bit more to that and what that, that means from a coaching standpoint, really instilling that Arsenal DNA in young players, as you said, from age eight, age nine, all the way through to winning an under 15s tournament? I think the thing is, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, let the game be the teacher and, you know, um, unopposed work versus opposed work and everything like that. And I think what, a lot of younger coaches miss the point. And listen, I'm so lucky because when I walked into the doors at Arsenal, I had Neil Banfield, Paul Davis, the old Andy McDermott, you know, people of that ilk to be able to go and learn from amazing right. individual developers. You know, Don was the greatest of all time. I'm still gay. I couldn't spend more time with him because watching him work is something I can't even describe. But they, they understood the principles of the individual within the team environment. And unfortunately, too much, you know, there's too much tactics nowadays and everything like that. So people are looking at the tactics and the team side more than the individual development. And right. I think that where, you know, the big mistakes made. And I, I don't think we do that at our club. You know, and I certainly can only talk really from the bits that I work on. And it's about principles and making that individual the best individual they can be. And then the principles of how that works within a team, you know, is, 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 is really important. And if you coach that well, the team gets to come out. So, you know, we don't spend hours and hours and hours down like, this is a tactic, here you go. But yet yeah, our team had more patterns, could play in a certain way, but we still have principles and that players utilising it on the pitch because you're not going to teach them a run and say, you have to do that one. It's like, here's the options. The picture looks like this, right. and you have the option. And they, they've got to learn by that and they'll make mistakes through that. You know, particularly if you're playing out the back, you're going to make the other mistake here and there, and you know, it, it's set forward like a long run or whatever. You know, those things, things are going to happen. So it's about how you develop those individuals. Because ultimately, it's the individual that has got hopefully the chance of playing in our first team. You could win with the FA Youth Cups your life and everything like that. That doesn't necessarily manifest into a lot of players going into the first team. You right. know, it's, uh, I always tell the story of them. Um, I, with Chris Jones, he took a team up to Leicester when we were at Stars. We got absolutely murdered, six to eight. Our goalkeeper didn't have the best day. We used for any goals. Tottenham got eight crows out on that team. Wow. And six of them have played over 150 games in the Premiership. Leicester had wow. one. So it just shows wow. you that. So who you was know, in our Tottenham team? We put Harry Kane, Angus Townsend, you know, very, very, very good players that have gone on and had very, very good careers. Sure. Let's have one. And, you know, it just shows you that, you know, who's done a better job, you know, over a period of time. No one's been remembering that one wet Saturday after less than when you got drafts. So, right. you know, it's, it, you know, one of those on the worst loser in the world, you know, don't get me wrong, but 
it's about and it's easier when you get older you get more experience and i remember the experienced guys telling me this when i was uh when i was the young coach and i just wouldn't listen to be quite honest with you but it's always looking at the bigger picture looking at the if the intent of the players is there you can work with it if it ain't then you've got to look at yourself and make sure that you're doing everything you should be doing as a coach because Ultimately, if you're not getting the message across, that's something you've got to sort out. You know, whether the players are even a seat range should be able to improve them to a degree, do you know what I mean? So, um, 100%. So, yeah, it, it's that really. And I think that's what we do a, a, a really good job of. And we've got to keep, you know, it's not perfect. If you ever feel it perfect as an individual or as a car, then you're not going to move forward. But, you know, uh, I know from what we're doing and how we're trying to improve every day that I think we'll continually keep this in better and hopefully keep producing better and better players for the potential of the first thing. For sure. And I mean, I think with that Arsenal DNA, as you were saying, like it's almost behavioral learning on and off the pitch, right? Like you're, you're teaching them not make this run. It's if you make this run, this is the result that you might have. If you make this run back forwards the ball, this is a result that might come from it. And then allowing them to make that mistake on the pitch a few times until they've actually figured out when to make the correct runs. And you'll see even at the senior level, as I'm sure you would say, the players are still making some dis- mistakes on which run to make when and, and trying to identify. And that also comes down to the opponent trying to, you know, bait you into making the wrong run or whatever it might be. And I think, as you mentioned, also with the under 15s tournament, the Arsenal DNA is off the pitch as well. The players were cleaning tables, talking in chairs and things like that. And, and I think that's why there's such a, a love for this club and, and KLM specifically amongst fans is, is one of the academies that I see talked about a lot more by their fans. Like even, you know, Chelsea obviously has a great academy. Tottenham have a great academy, but you just don't see the fans talking about it the same way the fans talk about ALN. And I think we take a real pride in that Arsenal DNA that's instilled by great coaches like yourself. Well, and I think I remember how how they became, you know, the Carl family was obviously very powerful in the early twenties that they cut up a lot of money. He is amazing how they was. We did not a lot of us had that. Do you know what I mean? You know, yeah. the family orientation of the club at that time. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of love went into it, a lot of effort went into it, and took some very, very, very football players going less going into our first team or going into other people's first teams. And yeah. you know, it's um it's a special place now and you know, if I remember the first time I drove in it, the year, first year I was at Arsenal was the first year we moved into Ireland. And even at that point we had crusty pitches and old buildings and all that lot there. But then I had a had an aura that it continues to have today kind of thing that you don't get that when you go to a lot of training grounds. Particularly, it's a bit like the stadiums. A lot, a lot of stadiums are a little bit solid, aren't they? Howland's never been like that. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's strange in that regard. And you even see it with opposing teams when they come. They, they just walk in and look around and you can just tell that, you know, when you walk past the ball with all the gold tassels up in the cafe, the school with players that have gone through, you've got past all the different shirts and everything like that. But it's... Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's a mad place now. Then really, it's just got that aura, which is great for us, for sure. Um, you've worked under Arsene Wenger in a respect, and and now Mikel Arteta in a respect. What are some of the things that are similar about their two ways that they're kind of structuring the football club and and working the way down all the way through? Obviously, U16s and youngers, and and what are the some of the things that are different? I mean. Obviously, the first team managers have a lot to do. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. That, 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 an understatement. Um, and I think, you know, back when Arsenal was manager, I think what was helpful was the close relationship he had, obviously, with whether it's Donnell and your Banfield and all those guys were always looking. And then what they would have discussions about, they would be able to come back to that end and have discussions with us. And, you know, the first team had such a unique brand of football in the early 2000s with you know, Henri and Burkamp and all the players like that and the way they used to play. That just inspired our younger players and the coaches to get the teams playing like We knew to get a player in our first team, you, you couldn't be average. You had to be absolutely top of your class. Otherwise, you had no chance. So we knew like the technical and tactical um, kind of developing those players. Players have to have an intellect even more nowadays with all the tactics to go into things and set pieces and everything like that. And I think that came from the early time of how Arsenal kind of started things. And the bits that I watched with the first thing was what surprised me. And I saw this with Victor Del Bosco when I spent some time over Real Madrid as well was how they were good at basic practices, even with the best players, you know, seeing our 
you know, Thierry Henry and Atta to him, the most basic kind of perceiving and passing. But even if there was a little bounce on the pass, he would be nailed and he'd be on it. And I think, you know, just as uh, Xavi's talked a lot about this, hasn't he, around what it was like in Barcelona, how Guardiola wouldn't accept any slight or, 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 or anything like that. And I think that's a big thing that I'll expert into my coaching, that having that standard level, that it, this is how it's supposed to be. And Sorry. the players, we won't make mistakes on it, but I'm just saying, maybe you put it in there. You know, we can't have a couple on the ball. We can't be spinning. It can't be, you know, to the guy's neck. You've got to pass it properly. You have good technique. It's, it's things like that that I think really start getting embedded into the club. And certainly the flair side of things, you know, watching Henri, how he was in 1v1 situations. We knew players, you know, English players weren't massively like that back at that time, were they? You know, you yeah. only had the last cancer and that, the good thrillers and, and, and what have you. And you have a look at now, the kind of breed of young players that are coming into the, the England squad, whether they're coming through Arsenal or other, other clubs, we've got much more, you know, one being lined up on the we were having the, in the past. And I think Arsenal was certainly one of the first clubs to really start developing that and going for it. It's a big thing for us and a big thing that, you know, I personally work on a hell of a lot with players as well. So I think that's how we are at the moment. I think the club's just got an amazing momentum to it. And, you know, the first team are doing so, so well. Things are progressing so, so fast. But we just got to keep pushing the envelope with these players and, you know, make them as good as we possibly can, make them, um, and just keep, you know, giving the manager a problem with him and a good player. Like that. That's all we can keep doing, you know what I mean? 100%. So, and, you know, not all of them are going to come through. You know, the thing is, when you're an Arsenal, you've got so many good players. You know, you look at Murray Hutchinson, that's doing very well, it's switching now and stuff like that. Yeah, he's been you know, excellent. We can't keep everyone. This is impossible, isn't it? You know what I mean? So you all get to release good players and, some like, you know, progress better than you thought they are, some might not. And, you know, it's just the way it is when you've got such a plethora of slots on it. It's just how it is, unfortunately. Yeah, you mentioned that you took the words right out of my mouth, which is like, obviously, I'm sure you've seen discourse all over different social media, on TV, about how now there's not as much youth playing. And obviously, it's because the club has taken such major strides from four years ago when, you know, Arteta first came in. We were, you know, kind of realigning principles at the club. There was opportunity for players. Now we're at a situation where every single player in the starting 11 probably has a market value of above 60 million pounds. So it's a little bit of a different situation. You mentioned how your job is to make that problem even worse. Bring more players that should be fighting their way into the first team. We saw Charles Sago Jr. get his debut this year, obviously. What does it mean to the players to even be involved in first team training, to even just be called up to the bench or travel with the squad? That Doesn't that mean just the world to a young player, even if they don't get to touch the pitch? I think it's funny, you know, because some may be, but they might all be the ones that end up pushing on. I think some <laughs> expect to be there sooner or later. Um, and that's not always the case as well. And, you know, hopefully when they get the taste of that, they just make them hungry to go and do more and, Try and get closer, closer to, to 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 bridge that gap. Um, but you know, patience is a key. I think you know, you look at what Guardiola did with um, Phil Foden, how he managed him. You know, the Man City fans were going mad. Well, they man should have played more and this, that, and the other. I mean, yeah, you look at the result he's got now. Do you know what I mean? And it, 100%. It's, it, it's not always stick them in, let them go and play 30, 40 games. You know, Wayne Rooney, they can't all be Wayne Rooney's and that. Some. It's or a soccer, yeah. Path. yeah, and the first thing we're in a different place. You know, if the first thing we're mid table, we might be slightly different. You right. know, and you know, I think patience is important. And I think when you look at the young players that have come through and established themselves in the first team, I think it'd be very difficult to, you know, criticize the club in the way they managed them because they got in there, they've been that sustained first team football and it'd been very, very important for them kind of uh, people within the first team environment. So, you know, it's it, it it's all that, you know, this is where support is one way to get it. And, you know, and people have got to just trust in the process a little bit. We've got great people at the club who know what they're doing. You just got to trust in it and the right moment will be the right moment and they'll either take it or they won't take it. Like, it's, it's as simple as that. And as a coach, when you're trying to identify talent in a player, kind of what are the key principles that you see in the most successful players, whether they're players who have success at youth levels, success at Arsenal and other clubs, are there certain things that you kind of see a line across multiple different players that you you would consider successes? I think the big thing is being coachable is really, really important. You know, being open to new ideas and 
understand insightful criticism because you critique and such these are more now if you imagine every video you, you can't get away with that past you know <laughs> no, no stage of weight or um but i think it's it, it, it's it's the players that are just driven to do more it, it's as simple as that you know it, i remember charlie casino he trained with the first team and the next day he's come to Halley and we do need to come to Halley and ask to do a one-to-one session with me and so hell but all the session we checked into the physio goes, you know that's just the mindset of that 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 player you know and um i think those players if will give themselves more opportunities than others. The ones that really want to do more. And they're all, you know, if you speak to a young player, they'll tell you the thing you want to hear. The proof's always in the pudding when you know, they really want to be on that pitch when it's cold and wet. They really want to be pushed and do things that they're not very good at. Do you know what I mean? You know, it's right. about the, you know, their super strengths, which is obviously really, really important. But, you know, making them better at the things they're not good at is as important. And I think... I can't think of any of the players that I've worked with over the years that haven't embraced that. The ones that have got to the premiership or international level or even higher championship level, you know, the ones that will really put themselves out there and embrace what they're telling them and work on, work on the things they're not good at. You know, not everyone wants to do that because you can't put a clip of you misplaced in a pass or falling like a ball on Instagram because you're not going to get any followers. That's a little bit how life is now, isn't it? Unfortunately. Yeah, but, for sure. So you're right, isn't it? So you've got to make the errors to be able to get better. And um, I, I, I certainly think we've got a, a culture of players that are like that at the moment, uh, which is which is great, really. It's brilliant to work with. It it really is. And I mean, you mentioned him. So who are some of the you know players that you're working with now? Anyone you would want to talk about for other than Charlie Patino, who has that mindset, somebody that you know is exciting both as a mental prospect and and obviously their ability on the pitch. I mean, I won't talk about any of the younger players because they all get too much pressure on bloody social media as it is. So I'm not talking about that to them. Um, sure. I mean, we're not, not at the moment with, with Justin Allen and the 15s. Really, really brute work ethic is incredible. One of the best work ethics I've, I've, I've had in all years. So all credit to them and they're improving. I think, you know, like back to the beginning, I remember watching Ryan Smith, who is still the best play up I've ever seen that only and the way that he moved for the wall and you know he made his debut with Sesk obviously back yeah. in the early thousands it was just incredible the way he would carry it all and go 1v1 one one. he was so unlucky with the horrendous knee injury he got when he was playing in reserves against Ipswich and I saw Ryan just last night actually but you know he was you know and still is the best 1v1 one one player I've ever seen um, the way you just glide it and stuff like that. So he was a real benchmark and someone I was really lucky to work with for a period of time. We really taught me a lot about things that I didn't know enough about, about how to beat players and how, you know, what it was like for him as a kind of left winger and whatever. But he was fantastic and a real shame that, you know, he got his injury when he did. And, you know, you talked about, you talked about Jack, talked about Henry Lansbury, who's an amazing player, you know, to see passes just couldn't see. Uh, you know, I remember mean, taking a keep ball session and he played it all I, could, I didn't even see. And that was one of the one of the times where I knew that I stepped back and look away from the ball more as a coach. I was with too much of the ball and he right. really taught me that, you know what I mean, at 11 or whatever he was. And, you know, and then you just, you just got, you got, like, obviously Miles and Ethan that everyone talks about now, you know, players with worked with over the years that are doing, doing really well with that. You know, that Charlie, Charlie Latino's age group, you've got Marcelo and Amari, Jack Henry Francis, you know, we are, where do you stop? You know what I mean? I, we are so lucky. Every time you go through those, those gates of hell in, you're working with top people, whether it's the staff or whether it's the players. And I think there's certain players that push you more as a coach, you know, maybe like a Ryan Smith or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's just, you have to pinch yourself sometimes not to get used to it. And I think that's why I'm quite lucky with my journey where I started at Arnett, where we didn't even have pitches. I remember <laughs> on a, it was a Tuesday night, you know, sorry, had to turn on one set of the side pitch because, you know, we didn't have old, just just sponsored kick up to get kit, you know, so you remember that. And I remember when we were at Brentford, um, you know, the pitches, that one streak of all the pitches, you know, now, you set a hole up and the ground was like, how much water do you want on the pitch? You know, it's just like, you've got to pitch yourself sometimes with, you know, whether it's the facilities, the support staff, or whether the players, you know, it's just such a high level. Uh, and you've got to bring it as a coach. That means, 
Do you know what I mean? There's no off days. You can't waste a second. You've got to go in there and you've got to be that's you got to be a deserving. I thought I'd be one of the best countries around. I thought I mean, I do say which time like I'm doing those players a service, I'm doing a kind of service. So that's the challenge we have as that as as countries to be able to come every day and be better. So yeah, I, I, it's a bit of a long winded answer really, but there's too many players to mention. You know, I've learned so much of so many so many players. It's it, it, it's incredible really. Well, you've been incredibly generous with your time. I'm just going to give you one final question, and it doesn't even have to be related to any coaching moment, but just what has been your favorite moment at Arsenal in your career? Could be a match you went to that was not a youth match. It could be uh, a Lansing pass in training that changed your mind about how you coach. What is that one memory that you would say is your absolute favorite? Uh, I think it's the first time I watched on how it work. I think, you know, that... It, uh, people will never understand how much of a top how she was unless you watch do or you work closely with him and all that lot and you know uh, I've said it before that you know watching him but at times I got to watch you which as I say I go it was more I think it was such an inspiration you know I just spent hours and hours at home afterwards spreading a little thing like that and you know even more than winning tournaments and seeing the players make the first scene, which is brilliant. You know, Ryan Smith was probably the first player that I walloped with that went on to then playing the first scene. I was there in the stadium when he did that, and that was amazing. Do you know what I mean? Game that yeah. I worked with the player playing at Highbury. But I still think, from an inspirational perspective, it's something that's stuck with me over all these years. I think, you know, just spending that moment with him, and, you know, it was, it was funny because I remember... Um, one of the guys who worked with Ian Brown said, don't go too close to Don, he won't want to be near him. So I was standing on the other side of the park and he just calls you over. What are you standing over there for? Come and stand here. And he was talking to you like he's known you for many years. And, you know, it's it, not everyone's like that, certainly in the modern game, not everyone's like that. We're lucky at our club, we're a big while. But, you know, I'd say that is a standout moment and something that I'll never forget. And I always say that. You know, if I even can be a quarter of the coach that he was, you know, then I'll be doing a good job. So, so yeah, I think that's probably the, the biggest standout moment, I'll say. Well, that sounds like a pretty amazing moment for sure. Dan, thank you so much for all your insight, really. I mean, I learned a ton. I'm sure the people who listen are, are going to feel the same way. Appreciate your time. Is there anything else you would want to add? Anything you want to say? Anything you want to plug? No, I mean, all I'd say is, you know, I think what our fans is this to you guys and what have you is just how we can help the players not pile loads of pressure on them and stuff like that and social media and everything like that that comes with it I think you know whatever you know this is an Arsenal family isn't it we all want all the players to do well I think how everyone can support the players really good the bad and indifferent I think will make a make a massive difference and I think you know Ednos and Arsenal players and Arsenal player, whether they're there for a, a month or whether they're there for 20 years and I think We've got to always treat them that way. And I think we always have to, and that's what makes this a special academy and a special club. So I think that's the key for me is just helping, particularly, as I say, with the social media side of things nowadays, is, you know, really help the players be able to go on their journey without feeling that added pressure would be something I think we're, we, we can all do a better job of going forward. I think that's definitely a fair point and, and one that even myself could, could, could learn a little bit from. Uh, all right. Thanks, Dan. Everyone, that's another episode of Away From Hail End. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe, comment, whatever you'd like to do. You know the thing, and we will see you next week.